you're listening to the VSL Aviation Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Lake, and this is episode 23. Thank you for listening. In today's episode, I'll be sharing with you a live episode we recorded on Discord and YouTube Live. If you're not into the live recording, no worries. We'll have those uploaded to YouTube and the podcast feed for your convenience. In this podcast, I also reference a couple of times a new ACE document. The ACE Guide is a new interactive document by VSL Aviation. This document replaces the interactive ACS guides that we showcased on previous shows. So if you're in the market of an excellent study tool, I would suggest that you at least consider the ACE guide. We have a couple of videos that showcase its capabilities. And if you visit our storefront on Shopify, you can download a free version of the Private Pilot Airman Certification Standards that gives a demonstration of how the guide works. As always, I thank you so much for listening and hope you enjoy the show. Please send any feedback to vsl.arrow and check us out on Discord, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. See ya. We've already got a couple of good questions coming in. And uh, what I'm going to do is just take some time to kind of talk talk to you guys about check ride preparation, answer any questions that you have. Uh, so John, I was going to start out with the, the G1000 uh, question. And so the question yeah. from uh, True Flight is... Can you take an aircraft with known avionics issues like a G1000 uh, heading going out randomly every flight to the check ride? Because that is what my former flight school has. Um, I guess the short answer is no. If, if you know you have an issue, uh, it's a known issue, and it's not working as advertised, uh, and you wouldn't be comfortable flying in, in instrument conditions, then you probably couldn't take that to a practical test. Now, if you're looking at, um, if, if you have some sort of KOEL and you can prove, hey, I can fly with this inoperative equipment, then it needs to be placarded appropriately. And if there needs to be a logbook entry, that needs to be done. And then I would also let the examiner know ahead of time so that they can tweak any plans of action or scenario that they have that might require that type of capability, because if, if that's a needed capability for their scenario and then it's not operative, then that could lead to a discontinuance um, at, at best. At worst, it could lead to a disapproval because then you as an applicant are saying a plane is airworthy when it's not airworthy. Um, so it kind of depends on what the issue is. Hey Seth, does the ACE guide have like a, a flow for in-off equipment? Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks for that, John. So, if on the ACE guide here, uh, if you go to either the private or the commercial, it's in area of operation one, and then we would look at airworthiness requirements. Uh, in the airworthiness requirements, we have two resources here. We have uh, an equipment flowchart uh, or, or required equipment. So this is your 91205s, kind of a memory aid there. And then we have the equipment flow chart, which is kind of a decision tree. Um, it, it's not super well designed. I'm hoping to make some adjustments to it, but it, it's pretty straightforward. You just follow the arrows down to see, hey, is this required by the day type certificate or by AD or by FAR? And it leads you down a decision tree on, yes, you can fly with it, um, or uh, no, you, you cannot fly with it. So. Those are two good resources there. And then also in the, in the new version of the ACE guide, I'll zoom in so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, but I've started to add uh, all these purple links lead to a section of the um, FARs that are applicable to this knowledge item. So in this case, uh, we're, we're dealing with flying with inoperative equipment. So that's 91213. So if you were to, to click on that, it would take you directly to the ECFR site on 91.213 for inoperative instruments and equipment. Uh, so that would help you both in studying and kind of making the decision process there. Uh, of course, you need an internet connection for that to work because the, the FARs aren't um, integrated into this document. So it just links to the website version of that. Okay. Uh, What's up next, John? So Winston, Winston Benjamin has a question. Uh, his question is that he's flying a 172 with a 180 horsepower supplemental type certificate that raises this uh, max, max takeoff weight to 2,550 uh, 2, pounds. 
the STC doesn't provide new performance data or vSpeeds. He wants to know if it's acceptable to use this data from another source, like a 172Q. Okay, yeah, this is great. So operating with a supplemental type certificate, this is one of the things that gets missed a lot because when you, when you show up, uh, or a lot of the guidance that's out there is I need the aero documents. So let's think about what you have to have on the airplane to operate with this STC. So the aero documents is the airworthiness, the registration, operating manual, weight and balance. Well, that's not everything that you need because in addition to the aero documents, the uh, operating manual or operating limitations, a lot of times the STC will say, hey, in addition to the manufacturer's operating limitations, you need the operating limitations for uh, the STC. So we, we also need some sort of supplemental uh, or a supplement for that STC. And so what Winston is saying is there is there may not be a performance supplement, but there should be some other form of supplement. So I would check the STC. The STC will say, hey, to for this STC to be legal, you need to have X, Y, and Z documents on board the airplane. So first and foremost, make sure you have everything that you need for that STC, and that includes uh, a flight manual supplement. Okay, so the supplement will tell you what you need to do. So the supplement might say, uh, and, and these are different, uh, but since this one does raise the max takeoff weight, there should definitely be something else in there. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second, but the, the supplement may say this meets or exceeds all performance data. So just use the, the, main, the old performance data and just know that this plane is going to exceed that. Okay, so you're just being conservative when you run the old numbers. You know that you're going to be able to take off in less than that. Um, so it may tell you to do that. I wouldn't suggest going out and, and running the performance charts from another airplane. Uh, unless the STC specifically tells you to do so. So just run your current numbers and just know that you're going to outperform that. But be able to show the examiner, hey, here's where the, here's where the supplement tells me to do what I'm doing. Now, if the supplement doesn't have anything, I would still run the old numbers and then maybe run the new numbers off, like you said, the 172Q, something that had similar performance characteristics. Uh, and just kind of show the examiner, hey, I'm doing my best here to figure out what this plane's actually going to do, and, and here's what I did. And I think most examiners would be okay with that. Now, the max takeoff weight increase, that typically comes with a new placard requirement. So that's why you need to get into that STC and C, because that STC will sh should say uh, there's a new placard that's required on this airplane, and that the placard usually these max takeoff weights say, hey, you can take off at an increased max weight, this is what it is, but in order to do so, the plane has to be equipped with like six ply tires, or something like that. So that's another reason to look at that STC to make sure you have all the required placards on the plane. And uh, I've, I've personally seen a lot of, uh, or I personally like the ARO acronym. I've amended that to SPARROW and the S being uh, supplements. They say if you're yeah. G1000, you have to have your G1000 supplements and the P would be placards because there's required placards. And yes, that's all in the POH of the aircraft, but it's useful to kind of remind yourself that, hey, I, I need those. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of my process when I fly a new, I, you know, I fly a lot of different airplanes doing check rides. So when I walk up to an airplane, and I know other examiners are similar, but we can simply look at the dash and I'm asking myself, well, how many of these things do I see in this dash that probably weren't on the airplane when the airplane was delivered? Um, so if I go up and I see a G5, uh, a new transponder, and a Garmin 430, and an autopilot, well, that's four supplements. So automatically, I look for the flight manual, and then I see, hey, do I have four supplements in the back of that flight manual? Because every new thing on the plane has to have a supplement uh, or, or a placard. So that's, yeah, arrows, sparrow, those are, you know, a couple different... Uh, you know, modify that new mnemonic if you're going to use it. Don't just use arrow because arrow is missing some stuff. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to know. Um, now, Charlie in Discord has a question for you. Uh, he has an AGI and IGI certification. He wants to know if that will make his uh, CFI initial check ride easier. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. What that does is the 
the AGI and IGA, when you go to your initial um, CFI, you're already going to have completed the fundamentals of instruction. So this is up to the examiner because you're dealing with the PTS and the PTS operates a little bit differently. I know a lot of you all have watched my content. I get this feedback a lot of, hey, when are you going to do a CFI uh, prep? And I was really waiting for the new ACS to come out, but I might just go ahead and do it on a PTS. But long story short, the PTS gives, still gives the option for the examiner to evaluate you on the FOIs. However, since you already have a ground instructor rating, uh, they don't have to. So it really depends on that examiner's plan of action for you on, on the CFI. There's nothing that says, hey, don't test the FOIs, but it does give us the option to, to not do that. Uh, if you look at the PTS, actually, there's only, I think, three FOIs that we have to ask questions on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's not like it has to be really, really long. I know some examiners go through every single FOI. Um, that, that's not actually a requirement from the PTS. So I guess the, the short answer is they could, but you have the option not to. I definitely wouldn't say, hey, the examiner's not going to ask me any of the FOIs, so I'm just going to go into this test, having not brushed up on those and been, been current on that. How about Sven Amy's? In... Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I like, that's a, we're kind of covering some inst instructor stuff, so that's the CFII. Biggest weaknesses on the CFII. Yeah. Um, make sure... You know, you're, you're having to demonstrate teaching, and you asked, are you going to have to, is the applicant going to do all the flying, or is the examiner? The examiner will probably fly at least one approach. I, would, I typically am going to fly two approaches, and then have you, the applicant, fly one. And I'm going to make some standard errors in there. The, the biggest error that I see is kind of the same one on the instructor, and that's the applicant not being, not owning the profile. And, and owning the check right, right? I expect you as the instrument instructor to show up and be able to piece together this. And, and my scenario is I want you to give me a uh, instrument proficiency check. So in my scenario, I'm a rusty GA pilot who's an active airline pilot, and I want to rent a, a 182 and take my family on a trip. So that's the scenario going into it. I expect you as a CFII to hear IPC, and be able to build a profile within a, a pretty reasonable amount of time of, uh, from getting the call. You know, I give you a couple days to prepare, but be able to construct an IPC and show up and, and complete every single item on that IPC to make it a legal IPC. Um, the weak area that I see is the instructor shows up or the applicant shows up for the test and their instructor is usually at this point they're getting their their double i add-on so they're already an instructor and they show up and they're like okay tell me what to do and i'll i'll do it well that's that's not what i'm looking for i'm looking for you to have a plan of action for me and saying okay seth here's what we're going to do we're going to go up and we're going to do this ils via vectors and then hit this mr approach point do a hold come in for a circling whatever it is and you've you know, got a good plan of action for how to accomplish all that. So that's kind of a lack of leadership is the weak area that I see with the double I ride. Uh, and I've said this before, just don't be a victim of the check ride. Don't come in and be like, okay, uh, you know, I'll, I'll answer anything you ask. Just come in and own it and say, hey, here's what we're going to do today. All right, what do we got next? You said Sven. So Matt, actually, Matt B uh, Bussell in uh, YouTube has a quick question. Uh, regarding what you, what he thinks, uh, he's curious as to what you think the most difficult top three check rides are. Um, whew, I would say the instrument's probably the toughest, followed by the commercial and private, and that's that might be different because depending on who you are, the private is probably one of the toughest because that's your first and you're really nervous. So from an applicant standpoint, the private is a that's your first check ride. And you're still doing a lot, so there's some difficulties there. But if you, we look objectively at the mechanics and then the standards, the performance standards, the commercial is definitely harder than the private, but the commercial is usually like the third check ride you've taken. So from a stress level, you're maybe less stressed about the commercial. Um, so stress level, probably private is the most stressful. Commercial, 
because people don't like answering questions about uh, holding out and stuff, I think. Uh, and then the instrument, I think, from the stress level is the least stressful. For me, instrument flying is kind of, I, I like it, I enjoy that. But um, objectively, probably the commercial and instrument are the toughest. I don't think I did a good job answering that, but I just talked about it for a little bit. I, I kind of agree with that, the stressful por portion of that, for sure. Moving down to, to Sven here, he wants to know if you have any advice for a, newly, a recently minted instrument pilot that's struggling to continue the journey. First of all, fully realize that flying is difficult, right? So flying, or flying from a financial standpoint, what I'm fixing to say it's a lot easier for me to say than for you to actually go do. But I've, as having an instrument um, rating, the best way is to go out and use it and, and challenge yourself. So, and, and try to incorporate some fun into that. But go out there and operate in the system because I, I see most people with their instrument, your private and instru instrument, minus a few, maybe 61 operators, you've probably been flying at the same three or four airports a lot. And outside of those three or four airports, you don't have a lot of experience. Um, so the normal progression is private instrument, and then you're kind of building some hours to get to that commercial level. So find a good pilot that, that you want to split safety pilot time with, file an instrument flight plan, and, and do a fatten back is what I, we used to call it in the Air Force. But you fly somewhere, you get lunch, and you fly back. Um, and pick out some airports that are either, you know, good restaurants nearby or maybe some challenging airspace uh, or just an area of the country that you want to go. Um, but kind of challenge yourself and start by giving you a few days to plan, but then try to work it where you can plan these flights in just a, you know, a couple hours. You should be able to plan a, a good instrument flight in just a couple of hours rather than, you know, what you're used to as a private where you might plan, you know, a couple days in advance and you're really looking at this because your, your goal, especially if you're doing this as a profession, eventually you're going to get to the level where you get handed a dispatch sheet and you're taking off in, you know, 40 minutes. Uh, and I'm not saying, you know, we do that at the airlines, of course, with a ton of support uh, that's, that's doing all the planning and stuff for us, but work on those planning skills and the de decision-making skills and operating in those different, um, different types of airspace and different airports uh, while, while you start building your hours towards that commercial time. But don't just go out and burn holes in the sky and, and don't go up and just fly VFR, but fly IFR on an instrument flight plan you're kind of putting some skin in the game, right? You're holding yourself accountable because you know that if you don't hold altitude or heading, then you might get a legitimate pilot deviation. So uh, filing a flight plan kind of, I guess, gives you a little more motivation to fly well uh, and fly procedurally correct and, and keep you sharp. Uh, I've seen a lot of pilots get a, a lot of time, you know, thousands of hours. I think I said this maybe in another live broadcast, so it's going to sound like I'm hating on this group of pilots, but I'm not. Uh, but I've seen pilots that are doing a lot of pipeline or visual flight. Um, so pipeline patrol or survey, aerial survey, they haven't flown IFR very much. They got thousands of hours, but since they haven't flown IFR, they're, they're talking on the radios. You know, they're not that confident talking in the ATC system, especially at those busier airports. And then they're not that confident in the IFR environment and their, their instrument cross-check isn't as good. They have a lot of hours, but those are important skills are lacking. So go out there and fly by instruments under the hood with a safety pilot to fun places and, and eat food and try to enjoy aviation along the way. That's what I recommend. Going back to uh, the person before we spent, uh, where you mentioned uh, the how on the commercial there's the difficult questions about holding out and such. Uh, Charlie in Discord wants to know how you personally would expect students to answer uh, those kinds of questions on the check ride. Okay, so I'm going to go to uh, Advisory Circular 61142. Uh, I think this is one of the better documents that the FAA has. It's a newer document. It's, it's a better document to talk about illegal charter, even though the, the name of this is sharing aircraft operating expenses. This, this is an important advisory circular to, to know because once you get your commercial rating, you can still operate under your private rating. When you go out and fly, so like, so like when I go fly my, my privately owned airplane, I'm, I'm using my private pilot certificate. I'm not using or my private pilot privileges. I'm not using my commercial pilot privileges. So 
understanding some of these principles is really important and that's a big one knowing that just because you have a commercial pilot certificate doesn't mean you're always exercising commercial pilot privileges so you can only operate commercial pilot privileges under the umbrella of a part 119 certificate holder when you're doing common carriage having the the understanding of those core principles is really important so this is a, a good advisory circular to talk about cost sharing so that's when you're splitting the cost using private um, privileges. And then in the legal interpretations uh, section here, I've got a few, um, I've, I've kind of cherry picked some common legal interpretations that talk about common carriage and you know what, what we should avoid. Uh, the Habercorn 2011, that talks about using social media um, for common purpose. Again, that would be more of a illegal cost sharing. Um, so there's some good legal interpretations in there. Some core principles that I think we get hung up on are holding out. So a lot of commercial pilots want to talk about holding out. It's usually when I ask what are your limitations as a commercial pilot, one of the first answers that I get is, well, I can't hold out. Holding out is um, it's important, but it's not the most important thing to know as a commercial pilot. The most important thing to know as a commercial pilot going into this check ride is knowing the difference between uh, operational control and PIC authority. So as a commercial pilot, you know, I fly for, um, I've flown for a Part 135 charter air ambulance and I've, I've flown for Southwest. So when I fly for these, these two operators, I'm never in operational control of the airplane, and neither is the captain. Um, Southwest is in operational control. We're just the pilots. We're just exercising pilot and control authority, but not operational control. So where you can get into trouble as a pilot is when you're doing both. If you're acting in operational control of the airplane and you're the pilot in command of that airplane, and you're making money, there's a high likelihood you're doing something illegal, whether you intend to be doing that or not. Um, and intent has nothing to do with it, uh, and then profit doesn't have anything to do with it, to make it even more confusing. So you can break these rules without even making money, because the FAA is like, yeah, anything can be compensation. So. Um, I feel like I just shotgunned a bunch of answers there, but knowing your Part 119 um, exceptions, so Part 119E in there, that, that lists all the uh, exceptions to ways you can operate without being holding a 119 certificate. And 119 certificates, that's like a, a charter or an airline or, or something like that. And then knowing the difference between um, operational control and pilot and command, you know, what, how that works. So those are important topics. The, uh, the other thing that I'll, I'll just touch on briefly is there is, you can do private carriage and private carriage is kind of listed in there as an exception. So private carriage is like, well, if, if Bob over there owns an airplane and he hires me to fly that airplane, I can do that for him without having a, a charter certificate or anything like that. That's fine. Um, and I can even kind of advertise myself, sort of. You want to be careful with that, of course, but I, I can tell people I'm a commercial pilot, and I can even offer to do pilot services for them. What I can't do is I can't advers advertise myself as, a, um, as an operator where I'm in operational control. And there's several questions that you have to ask of operational control, like who's buying... Who's paying for the gas? Who's paying for the airplane? Who decides where the maintenance is done? Who decides who the how the crew's qualified? There's several questions in there. There's a uh, an advice another advisory circular called Truth and Leasing that you can look up that has those questions in there. So um, understand that holding out, you know, that's just advertising, and then being able to define operational control. Those are two really important principles as a commercial pilot. All right, we we'll get next, John. Astral Body on Discord wants to know uh, when you think it'd be best to uh, get a tailwheel and like a, a seaplane certificate uh, in training. Do you think it makes more sense to get it 
you know, after instrument, before commercial, or do you think it even matters? Yeah, it's it's up to you. Those are both really fun ratings to get, so you might use those as kind of rewards for yourself. So you got two fun ratings in there, your tailwheel uh, endorsement, that's a cheaper one also, and then your seaplane rating, uh, that's a little more expensive, so you know maybe use that as kind of a a carrot for yourself. So say, hey, I'm going to get my tailwheel done as soon as I get my instrument rating done, or I'm going to get my uh, seaplane right after your commercial. The seaplane is the one I would recommend getting it after your commercial, because then what you'll do is you'll get commercial privileges single engine C. If you take your seaplane rating before you take your commercial, then when you take your commercial, you're going to have to take another seaplane uh, check ride if you want commercial seaplane privileges. So both the multi-engine add-on and the seaplane add-on I recommend doing after your initial commercial. So both of those ratings can just kind of get grandfathered in, for lack of a better term, into your commercial rating. If you take them before the commercial, then you're setting yourself up for extra check rides. Uh, the tailwheel, that's just an endorsement. It doesn't really matter when you get that. Uh, Not Jordan in YouTube has a question about um, what you think about using flaps on a descent past the final approach flex, fix. If he flies a 172N, he finds that it's easier with the autopilot to not introduce flaps until closer to landing. Uh, but he mentions that uh, the ACS talks about things like uh, being properly configured by the final approach fix. He wants to know your thoughts on that. Okay, so that's a good question. An industry standard Let's look at the, the goal of being a professional pilot. The industry standard as a professional pilot is to be in a final configuration by the final approach fix or somewhere around 1,000 feet AGL. Sometimes that's coincidental, but that's the goal. If you're not configured, checklist complete, in your final landing configuration by 1,000 feet, you're automatically doing a go around, and if you don't, the airplane will tell on you, and the chief pilot will call and say, Hey, why didn't you do? Why didn't you follow procedures? So that's kind of the, the the ultimate goal of where we're all headed as professional pilots. Those rules that apply in 121 world don't necessarily. They're not a one for one flying in a 172 because there's other things that we have to make decisions about, and one of those is you know energy management in 172 is a lot different than energy management in a 737. So if I put all of my flaps in, if I'm, if I'm planning on landing at full flaps, and I put all my flaps in the final approach fix, that is a lot of drag. And if I have any type of uh, loss of power or anything like that, I'm really having a negative impact on my energy state in that 172. Um, now the same isn't true for a 737. I got a lot of excess power in a big transport category airplane. So I can, I can do that much further out. But in 172, I really can't. So me personally, what I, um, a partial flap setting is a landing configuration in 172, kind of if you want to get technical about it. So what I would suggest is I would set uh, around 10, you know, try about 10 degrees of flaps, 10 to 15 degrees of flaps in the 172 at the final approach fix, decrease power and fly that until landing is assured. That's a little bit of a subjective statement, but, you know, 200 feet or minimums, whatever you want to call that. And then, if conditions permit, do my final flap setting somewhere around there with the goal of of being stable before I get to minimums. That would be my, my new goal there. Um, and I realize you're juggling a lot of different things there but uh, you know in a light twin this is really important to me because if I lose an engine and I'm in a a, a, a Beechcraft Traveler or a Beechcraft Baron and I go full flaps at the final approach fix and then I lose an engine uh, with full flaps gear down uh, a, a dead engine that's windmilling and full power on the operative engine I'm guaranteed at a about a 7 foot 100 foot a minute descent rate. Basically, I, I can't even maintain glide slope with full power. So in a light twin, I, I really don't, I don't teach going to full flap configuration until landing is assured for that reason because if I lose an engine from the final approach fix inbound, I can't even maintain glide slope 
uh, if I've got full flaps in. But if I have partial flaps, then I can at least maintain glide slope uh, coming down with that drag. So those are a couple of different reasons why I would suggest doing a partial flap setting at final approach fix. That way you're building the habit pattern of, hey, at the final approach fix, I need to be in some sort of landing configuration. I need to do a checklist, get all that done. But then only in lighter aircraft am I going to make a, a, a configuration change on down the road closer to minimums when landing's assured. Then I can get that extra drag out and do the landing. So that's what I would suggest. Um, we have uh, two questions uh, relating to the instrument check ride. Um, James S. In, on YouTube wants to know what knowledge section of the instrument check ride do applicants have the most trouble with? There's a lot of stuff in weather. Uh, typically, people study up pretty good on the on the instrument check ride for weather. But again, as a private pilot, I really just expect you to know what weather, you know, what, what my minimum weather is and how to stay away from it. As an instrument pilot, now you're flying in the weather, so you have to be able to analyze it a little bit more. So it's I expect a little bit more than just a surface level knowledge that you have to have in your private pilot. So make sure. Are you nervous about an upcoming check ride? Have you ever wondered what it's like to be a designated pilot examiner? In this show, I give you a behind the scenes look of the FAA check ride process. I'll show you best practices on how to have a successful check ride, common errors that applicants struggle with, and share with you some of the valuable knowledge I've gained throughout my 15 year career in military and civilian aviation. For more information about the show, visit our website, vsl.aero slash podcast. There you'll find the show library, various ways to support the show, and links to purchase our interactive airman certification standards study guide. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a five-star review. And most importantly, tell your aviation friends about the show. This is listener-supported content, and I plan on keeping it that way. So any way you can support the show through Patreon or PayPal is greatly appreciated. Consider how much you would normally pay for an hour of ground school with an experienced CFI. Thanks for listening, and back to the show. Here you study up and really have kind of a more fundamental understanding of the weather uh, and what I mean by that is how can, if I look at a prog chart from a couple days out, can you give me some sort of intelligent um, discussion about here's kind of looking at this information, what I expect to happen in, in a couple days time and how I'm adjusting my plan for that. Because uh, that's another weak area is an instrument pilot would just say, well, I'm not going to go. And instead of just saying no, figure out how. So very seldom is the answer no. Usually the correct answer is here's how I'm gonna do that. So if the weather's too bad today, it's not that I'm not gonna do the trip, I'm gonna just do it on a different day. So still you didn't say no to the trip, you just adjusted it for conditions. And the same thing of if I need to go somewhere, I might not be able to fly to that destination because it doesn't have an appropriate approach, but I might be able to fly to another destination that gets me lower minimums and then I can drive. You know, so kind of that little, little bit more thought in the plan of just saying, yeah, the weather's bad, I'm not gonna go. Uh, having personal minimums developed, uh, I did a couple short content pieces on this, uh, but develop some personal minimums and, and have them written down of here's my current personal minimums and then here's how I'm going to make my personal minimums better, um, kind of how I'm gonna develop myself. This is a good worksheet here. Uh, this kind of an IFR analysis, and and this is kind of what I would like to see during a check ride. Of you're not just getting the weather; you're actually doing a little bit of analysis to the weather instead of just, yeah, I got a weather briefing and the weather looks good, so we're going to go. We'll analyze that weather and figure out how it's going to impact our mission there. Issues that I see are probably related to reading the actual instrument approach charts. There's, there's a lot of data there. I mean, there's just so much. There's so many different types of approaches. So if, if you're from like the South Central United States and don't deal with terrain a lot, challenge yourself and start looking at those approach plates that are in mountainous terrain areas, looking at the different types of, uh, you know, obstacle departure procedures that are out there or, or being able to analyze a SID or a star, knowing what all those symbols mean. And this is a pretty easy exercise because you can just go, um, you know, maybe the goal is before every instrument flight, tell your CFI to pick out this interesting chart and, and try to play stump the dummy. You know, ask me about these symbols and see if I know what I mean, what they mean. I'm not going out there and issuing disapprovals for people that can't decipher every single thing on the chart. But if you start missing a lot of those questions, that could lead to 
Um, okay, now I'm seeing consistently not being able to know this, and that could lead to a disapproval. Uh, and then it's also stressful. Nobody likes getting questions wrong during a check ride, so that that kind of amps up the stress level each time you get a question wrong or you don't know the answer. So being confident on, on those approach charts um, is another item. There's probably other examiners out there that lot, ask a lot of questions about, you know, how's the diaphragm and the altimeter uh, work? And I don't ask a lot of those questions, to be honest. I, I really don't care if you can diagram out an altimeter because I, I fail to see how that can make you a better instrument pilot. But what I do expect you to know is, okay, if my altimeter quits working, how's that going to impact this flight? And, and what's my plan of action there? What, what other resources do I have to bring the flight to a safe conclusion should my pedostatic system fail? Uh, that's more along the lines of the questions I'm going to ask instead of just rote memory of how the aneroid wafer works. You know, I don't, I don't think I've ever asked that question. What else we got? Flight on YouTube wants to talk about endorsements required for the instrument check ride and what the applicant should be doing to prepare, assuming that they're already flying to the ACS standard. I think this relates to True Flight's uh, previous comment that he was having trouble getting his school to endorse him for his check ride. Okay. Well, that's that's pretty straightforward. Let's let's pull up part 61 here. So endorsements. Here's a just a quick rule about how endorsements work. Um, there's two ways that you can look at endorsements. You can look at endorsements on the 6165H. So I'll pull that up. Uh, this is a document that's going to be going into the ACE guide. The ACE guide really isn't optimized for CFIs yet, so I don't have all this the goody CFI stuff in there. Everyone's probably, or most CFIs have, have probably looked at this, and you go to your sample endorsements here. So first and foremost, every check ride you need this endorsement. A lot of CFIs will call it the Alpha 1 endorsement. I call it the 6139, because if you look at this, it the endorsement should read 6139A. So what that's referencing is back to FAR Part 61, and then subsection 39, and that's sure enough, 6139 is titled Prerequis Prerequisites for Practical Test. So you're going to have to have that endorsement. The deficiencies of a knowledge test, you need that endorsement as well, and that's also contained in 6139. And that's just discussing, hey, you need these, uh, you need to cover the questions that you missed on the written exam. So for the, uh, for the instrument, for the private instrument commercial, you have to have three hours of flight time within the previous two months. So if we scroll down here, you can go to the instrument rating endorsement and see that the, uh, the prerequisites for instrument practical test is a 6139A, that's what we just looked at, and then the flight proficiency practical test is in 6165. So I know I'm talking in numbers here, and I'm, I've got a bad habit of doing that, but that's, that's kind of how you talk when you're discussing these legal requirements for an endorsement because you're meeting the requirements of 6165. So if we go in 6165, that's the part of the FARs that define here's all the tasks that you have to accomplish for your instrument rating. Um, and so that's that's where we see the uh, has logged the required flight training within the previous two calendar months for the test. So that's the 6139 and the 6165 uh, and then the review of deficiencies. And a lot of times instructors can combine the knowledge test uh, review and the, the since they're both under part 6139, that's just one endorsement. So really just two uh, endorsements that, that I expect to see in there. The endorsements though, that's that's just part of the um, part of the thing that you want to see for the instrument. What you really want to see, is you want to audit your logbook and make sure you've met all the requirements that are outlined in 6165. So if we go back to FAR 61, subpart B has instrument rating requirements. So FAR 6165, this is, and see how these are 
the different paragraphs talk about different things. So we got aeronautical knowledge, flight proficiency. We were want, wanting the subparagraph D, which is your aeronautical experience. So you want to audit your logbook and make sure you meet all of these requirements right here in the aeronautical experience section. Because it doesn't matter what you're endorsed for. If your logbook doesn't contain this experience here, then you're not eligible for the check ride. So if, you're, if your flight school isn't endorsing you, what I would do is give your logbook a thorough audit, go over there with an instructor, tab everything out and say, hey, here's my logbook. I've met all the requirements of 6165. I'm ready for my endorsements. These are the endorsements that I need. And I, I would just do it that way. Um, but you need both of those. Um, Astro Body, I'd like to see the private pilot check ride diversion handled, uh, order of operations, etc. Okay, so let's go to, there's two places. Yeah, that's a good question. There's two places where this kind of talks about. So the first part is in area of operation one, uh, task D is our, is our navigation here. And so this one has you prepare a cross-country flight plan to the first fuel stop and then recalculate fuel reserves. So that's, that's in there, right? But then we go back here to our navigation, which is area of operation six, and task C is the actual diversion. So uh, the way I handle this in the check ride is we take off and the first thing we do of the first thing of the check ride, I hack the stopwatch as soon as you release the brakes. You have to show that you can plan to the first one, first or two checkpoints of your flight plan uh, within, and let's look here, is this here on navigation, pilotage and dead reckoning. You have to be able to navigate to that point and get there en route within five minutes uh, and then within three nautical miles. So five minutes and three nautical miles. So that's why I hacked the stopwatch. So when we take off, hack the watch, everybody gets there within five minutes. That's pretty easy. Get there within your three miles. Then I take the controls and I hand you the foggles. And I start the next scenario, and that is, okay, on your cross-country here, uh, the weather deteriorated much quicker than we anticipated, and now we've inadvertently um, penetrated weather. And I ask the simple question, what would you do in this case? And the correct answer is, of, well, I knew I, I didn't take off under IMC conditions, so it must be good weather behind me, so I'm going to turn around. I'm like, okay, that's a good decision. Uh, what's some outside resources that you have. And what I'm looking for is, hey, I'm going to call for help and say, hey, center, I just flew into IMC conditions inadvertently. I'm IMC. I'm not instrument rated. Uh, what's a good direction for me to turn for, for VMC conditions? And then I'm going to jump on, you know, the intercom as a simulated ATC and say, hey, uh, there's, I just talked to a, a, a pilot that landed at, at airport XYZ. Um, if you fly initially a heading of 350 and then proceed direct when able, that'll get you in VMC conditions. Okay, great. So then I've just kind of, we've, we've moved from the navigation exercise of the check ride into the diversion uh, section of the check ride, but we're also doing the basic instrument maneuvers check ride, right? Which re requires turns to a headings, you know, radio comms, navigation, radar. So we're now we're starting to check off a lot of those boxes of my plan of action. While you're doing the diversion, you're also including some of the instrument stuff in there. And that includes, uh, I'll have you take off without using the GPS. And then during the diversion, I'll say, hey, I want you to, you have your GPS back, start to use that and show me that you can use that 430 or 650 or 750 or G1000, whatever it is. Uh, show me that you can do that on the diversion. And if we go back to our diversion task here um, in the navigation, what the diversion says is you have to select a, a suitable destination and route for diversion, uh, and then you have to get, make a reasonable estimate of heading, ground speed, arrival time, fuel consumption to the divert airport. Reasonable assessment. It doesn't have to be exact. And so that's why I ask at some point after... Um, you've kind of settled in and we're on course to this new destination, I'll say, hey, you know, give me an estimated 
heading, ground speed, and arrival time, and then how much fuel do you think we're going to burn or have when we get there? Um, and so that's, that's how I'm going to handle the diversion personally in my plan of action. Um, Stephen Heckler in, on YouTube, uh, he got a new uh, Pipistrel Sinus LSA with a G3X. He wants to know if he needs an FA-approved uh, AFM supplement for that. Uh, the Pipistrel is a, an LSA certified. It's, that's a good question. I think you do, because unless it's experimental, did he say it's experimental? Sorry, I missed he did that. not. Okay. It depends on if it's experimental. If it's certified under light sport aircraft rules, I don't actually know the LSA world well enough to say that, hey, it has to have a supplement. Um, all the LSAs that I've flown, um, that's the nice thing about LSAs is they're very new. So all the LSAs I've flown have, they don't have any aftermarket equipment because they're all like brand new. Um, so I, I haven't experienced that before. That might be a good, usually those, uh, like the Pippis Trail dealer, whoever you bought it from, that would be a good question to ask them to see if it, does it have to have a supplement for that new equipment that you've installed. Uh, definitely, definitely worth checking into. Rod Childers on YouTube wants to know if an instructor endorsement is required for the commercial cross-country flight, which I would say probably not because nope. you're already a private pilot. Yeah, you're already a private pilot. That brings up a good question, though. Really plan out these flights for your commercial rating because uh, the rules in the commercial, and I'll go ahead and pull these up. So you have the option of doing the solo hours either solo or with an instructor. And it's either, you, you can do one or you can do the other. So don't try to mix and match times there. And I, I answered this question a couple times last week where a pilot did five hours with supervised solo time and then five hours of true solo time. That equals 10. Well, those that doesn't equal 10 for the purpose of the check ride. It has to be all 10 hours with an instructor or all 10 hours solo. So make sure you're not mixing and matching those and where you find those rules, uh, that's all in the aeronautical experience for commercial, which is 61-129. So it's listed right here. So those specifically the rules that I'm that I'm talking about is the subchapter four, which is 10 hours of solo flight time in a single engine or 10 hours of flight time performing the duties of pilot in command with a single engine with an authorized instructor on board. So there's a legal interpretation out there that says you can't mix and match those. Uh, Charlie on Discord wants to know what the main difference between the PTS and the ACS is. Uh, he understands that everyone he's ever met hates the PTS. <laughs> so let me show you something. If you search um, D-Regs, I'm just sharing my screen here so people are seeing me go through this. D-Regs on the FAA, this is, uh, if you really want to get into the weeds of check rides and tests and the difference between PTS and ACS, the 8900.1 has all the answers. So that's, the 8900.1 is basically a website now called the Dynamic Regulatory System. And so it's in volume five and then chapter two. So the 8900.1 volume five, chapter two, section one. It's like the most government thing I've ever said. They, yeah, it's, it's a very specific um, regulation. Anyway, this document, the 8900.1, Volume 5, Chapter 2, Section 1, talks about the differences of this is what a PTS is and this is what the ACS is. Uh, and this is just going to pull up a PDF document here. Yeah, page 11. It's... It starts talking about the differences between using a PTS versus an ACS. The PTS, basically two things. It includes the special emphasis areas. So the special emphasis areas um, are like land and hold short operations and taxi stuff. And it's added to, I believe it's in the front of the PTS. So you have to cover all of the in, when I'm developing a plan of action as an examiner, I have to examine you on all the special emphasis areas. The next thing that's different about a PTS is 
when I choose a task, I have to do everything in that task. I have to evaluate everything on that task. Whereas in the ACS, when I get to a task, so kind of going back to, um, let me pull up the ACS here, because I've got, I've got one in mind. Let's say we're doing the commercial pre-flight preparation weather information. So if this was the PTS, I would have to ask about every single thing on this page. That'd take a long time. The ACS, I have to do at least one knowledge, at least one risk management, and then three of the skills. The weather's interesting because in the weather's case, one of the skills tells you to analyze three of the knowledge topics. So there's a little bit of a circular reference. When we get down to there to skill two, I have to go back up and, and I'm doing this not actively, but while I, you know, when I'm writing my plan of action, I already accounted for this. But I have to ask you about three of the conditions above. If there was a PTS, I'd have to ask about every single one of those items in the task. So that's the main difference is the special emphasis areas. And then if you test a task, you have to test everything in that task. You can't just pick and choose stuff. I have a couple more questions if you'd like. Sure. Got a little more time. Um, the Matt Heaven in, on YouTube wants to know why so many instructors are pushing prep tools like Shepard Air when the FAA wants to use these uh, knowledge tests as a way to evaluate rote level of knowledge? I mean, short answer is that's the easy answer is, okay, I'm going to memorize the test and then I'm going to get past this test and then I'm going to rely on my instructor to teach me what's actually important. That's what I hear all the time is, well, I'm just going to get through this test and then my instructor is going to teach me the important stuff. My opinion, and to be clear, this is all this stuff is just my opinion. This not uh, unless I'm quoting FAA stuff, this isn't the stance of the FAA. So I'm not here representing the FAA or anybody I work for. Uh, maybe I should start doing that disclaimer. But my thought on this is the FAA has lost a little bit of credibility with the written tests because they weren't updated enough. They ask some pretty silly questions where it's like, well, you know, does me knowing this the answer to this question mean I'm going to be a safer pilot? And there were some examples in the test bank where that really wasn't the case. Um, so I think, um, you know, if you look at the airlines, for instance, 121 aviation, there's not a lot of written exams that happen in the 121 world anymore. And the 121 world is probably the safest mode of transportation ever devised by humans. You know, it's, it's incredibly, incredibly safe. So I think the FAA could look at how is the FAA evaluating their pilots and training their pilots. And let's try to incorporate some of that into the Part 61 world. And Part 61 is still kind of stuck in the past where it was a lot of written exams uh, a lot of rote memorization. I don't know that that makes you a better pilot, and it kind of it causes the whole system to lose a little bit of credibility. And people try to find shortcuts like they have with the, the Shepard Air part. So uh, Matthew Ryan on YouTube, it uh, sounds like a pretty detailed question. So you can kind of go into as much as you want, but he wants you to kind of cover Part 91 private carriage, 125 non common carriage, 135 on demand, and 121 commercial check ride. Okay, so broadly speaking, Part 91 private carriage is an owner slash owner operator flying in a plane that they own or they own and operate. That's the simple answer there. That's limited to that owner and operator's friends and family. The FAA has a couple of legal interpretations where private carriage does extend to friends. Okay, so you've I've done shows on how you, you need to have common purpose and you know you could accidentally get into illegal charter if someone asks you to go somewhere and then they do a pro rata sharing you know a cost sharing agreement with you and you never had intent to go there so there's no common purpose so really what that did is turned into an illegal charter the rebuttal I give, or the, the counterpoint to that I say is, well, what if my wife wants to go eat dinner somewhere? She wants to go to Kansas City for a, a nice steak, and it wasn't my idea. So now my wife asked me to go somewhere that I don't have a common purpose for, and I fly us there. Did I just break the law? No, 
I didn't. That's that's silly, because I kind of my private pilot privileges from a um, cost sharing standpoint kind of extend. I need to be careful what I'm saying here, but they kind of extend to my friends and family. They I can use my private privileges for my friends and family, and that's all private carriage. Okay. For the purpose of this, real simply, this could also be true for a business. If if I'm directly related to that business, that's private carriage. You know that would be fine. Where you could get, let's say, you're a full-time pilot for John Deere tractor. So John Deere, uh, big company. They've got a couple jets, I'm sure. But let's say you're you're flying with John Deere, and they don't have a. They're not operating under Part 135. They're John Deere is the operator in this case. They're the operational control. And you fly around John Deere employees all the time. That's private carriage. Totally fine. Well, if John Deere wants to kind of work with one of their suppliers and maybe give the suppliers a vacation to Disney, it's a, a plane ride, you know. Now you, you're the John Deere pilot flying a John Deere plane, but there's no John Deere employees on board, and you're taking some of the suppliers somewhere. To kind of wine and dine them, that could be common carriage. Uh, so that's an example of where that bled over away from the core business or the core family or friends, and that kind of bled into the common public. So that's a way. That's an example of how you could in inadvertently find yourself doing common carriage. Uh, when we get to common carriage, you can really only do that without any extra paperwork in smaller aircraft. Part 125 extends when we have a larger aircraft. So, um, for instance, um, a Boeing business jet. A Boeing business jet would need some sort of Part 125 letter of authorization because that's a very large transport category airplane that we're trying to fly in private carriage world. And we can't do that without some extra paperwork. So that's 125. Pretty uncommon, but you know, if you're operating a 125 or a big jet like that, you should know that. Uh, 135 on the demand and 121. Uh, I like to think about it in a way of how much of the public are you exposing to risk here? So a charter flight, uh, not a lot of people have access to Part 135. Not just anybody can go on Google and charter a flight somewhere. Now, there's still a large portion of the population can get to Part 135, but not, not, not that much. So the FAA is like, we're not going to make that uh, as safe as 121 because it's not putting as much of the population at risk because 135 is a smaller market. 121, I can go into Google, I can buy a ticket somewhere for 50 bucks. Basically, everybody in, in the country can access 121, so that needs to be the most restrictive. The important thing to note between 135 and 121, and Part 91 for that in, for that matter, is let's say I'm I go to to Boeing Field and I pick up a brand new 737 Max, and I fly it empty from Boeing Field to Dallas. That's a Part 91 leg. Well, when we land at Dallas, we pull into a gate, we load up passengers. Now we're on a 121, same crew, same airplane. But we just went from 91 rules. To 121 and we fly up to Detroit we offload the passengers and then we taxi the plane over to the GA ramp and we load up the Green Bay Packers and we fly them um, to uh, you know for a, a charter for a football uh, game that's a 135 so we just went from part 91 to 121 to 135 and I guess the first one might you know, yeah, that, that would have been a pure 91 leg. So anyway, we, we can operate in all of those categories transparently to the crew. What matters there is that you know what rules you're operating under so you know what your limitations are. And I'll give one quick example of how 135 and 91 operating seamlessly could happen. Uh, let's say you're working for a, an air charter service in a small airplane, like a caravan, let's say and you fly, you're done with your day, you're flying an empty leg home, and it's just you. Well, you're out of crew duty day. Your company, or you know, 
this wouldn't be a good company, I don't think that would do this, but they could. They could say, hey, we want you to fly that home. And you're like, well, I'm out of crew duty day. Well, crew duty day only applies when you're flying under part 135 rules. You're an empty leg home, you're 91, you don't have crew duty day. It's up to you. So you could legally fly home under part 91 rules because you're no longer 135 because this is a 91 leg. So knowing that you're not just a uh, these aren't stove piped rules where you're only operating in 135 or you're only in 121. You can kind of fluidly go in between those. Um, if you want some more, I'll copy one on YouTube. Uh, yeah, probably one more. Know your thoughts on uh, instructors and in flight schools uh, teaching their students to meet uh, specific DPEs like standards or you know specific ways they teach things rather than teaching to proficiency. What do you think on that? Yeah, I think I, I've definitely heard of that happening, and I try to avoid that as an examiner. Uh, we all, as examiners, should try to avoid that, and we're just examined to the ACS. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a tough, tough thing because the, I get it from a school standpoint of, like, yeah, this examiner really likes to fly to this airport, so we need to make sure you're really good at that airport, and we wind up teaching you how to take the check ride versus just training to proficiency. Um, and that's a challenge everywhere that I've seen is people get to the minimums, they get ready for the sign off and they get the sign off or they, you know, they get all the legal minimums for the sign off and they get signed off and we kind of just throw them at the check ride and see if they pass versus let's train a safe pilot. Let's get all the training done and then ask ourselves, is this a safe pilot? Is this a safe pilot? If the answer is yes, okay, now let's look at your logbook and see if you're qualified for the check ride. Um, versus saying, hey, the logbook's good, let's go to the check ride. A great example of this is like, when I see somebody come to me, and this happens a lot, is uh, they've got exactly three hours of simulated instrument time as a private pilot. You know what, why don't you have a little bit more? Because you had some cross country opportunities in here why didn't you put the hood on more? Why, why didn't you get more proficient at flying under the foggles? Why did you just do exactly three? Or why did you do, just do exactly five hours of solo? Um, and, and I'm not saying that's wrong, that's the legal minimum, but I kind of ask myself that, uh, especially if that student seems to be struggling, is like, well, why did you come to the check rate if, if you weren't really confident that you, you could pass? So, I mean, it's a good thing as an instructor, that's something you could change, of saying, hey, we're you know, we're all trying to build hours here anyway, so if it takes you a few extra hours to get more proficient and not just, you know, ready for this particular DPE, then let's do that. All right, well, I think that's that's it for uh, tonight. I really appreciate y'all joining us. Uh, if you're watching this at a later date, I'm going to post, post this on YouTube. This is going to be in podcast form, so you can listen to it. I'd love your feedback on this, because this is something I'm trying new, of taking this content and posting it on as many platforms as I can. Um, next time I'd really suggest joining us on Discord, uh, and, and we'll probably have more live events like this that are just on Discord, and then I post them as content later, uh, because I've, I've noticed that Discord is just a lot faster than, than some of the other live streaming platforms. So join us on Discord, Discord look at us, uh, look us up on Instagram uh, and Facebook. I'm making almost daily posts there. Not as much content going to YouTube right now, but that's, that is going to change. And then check out the Ace Guide here too. You can find that in our Shopify store. Links are you know, for there. So really appreciate everybody participating. Um, it's, it's exciting to get to talk with you guys. I really appreciate